Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, I had the remarkable chance to talk to one of my favorite scientists, an old friend, and one of the uh, most well-known and accomplished observational astronomers alive today, Wendy Friedman, who's now at the University of Chicago. She was the director of the Carnegie Observatories for many years, almost 30 years working there. And she has been involved in some observations of the most important features of cosmology, in particular, the measure of something called the Hubble constant, something measured by Edwin Hubble, the first observation in 1929 and 1930 that the universe was expanding. And you might think, well, we've observed the universe is expanding. Why do we have to keep looking at it? Because that number is central to our understanding of how the universe works. And in particular, for anyone who's read uh, the newspapers, there seems to have been a tension. We're measuring this expansion rate of the universe two different ways by looking at the very early universe and using theory to propagate forward to get what you should measure today. And then measuring it today gave different numbers. Different numbers that didn't seem to differ by very much, by 1% or 2%. And you might think, well, that's good. But the observers in each case claimed that they were measuring things to much better accuracy and the disagreement was significant. And if that di disagreement is real, then it, some people have argued you might require vastly new physics. And uh, because you're extrapolating from the early universe to the present universe by using the physics we now understand. And if that leads to disagreement with what you actually observe today, then maybe the physics we, uh, we think we understand is not what it was. And so this has become an even more urgent problem. And Wendy has been at the center of this by measuring the Hubble constant for the very first time with high accuracy, at that time at 10% accuracy in, in, uh, in early 2000s, and has been working on this um, since then. And I'm happy to say in, in our program, in fact, talks about a new result, which I'm not going to reveal now. That uh, may, that will address this very important question. At the same time, she's been the founding director of the biggest new telescope being built, the giant Magellan Telescope, that's going to be ready in the, in the 2030s to look at everything from new planets to maybe even Earth-like planets. And so we discussed all of that, including her own career as a young woman in science, initially interested in biophysics, moved into astronomy. It was a fascinating discussion. She's a charming and lovely individual, I know that, as her friend, but also a great scientist. And it was a wonderful chance to really dig into the details in a way that perhaps you won't get to hear anywhere else. So I had a wonderful time. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And you can watch it ad-free on our Critical Mass Substack site, or you can watch it later on on our YouTube channel, our Origins Project, our Origins Podcast YouTube channel, or you can listen to it on any podcast listening site. And however you listen to it or, or, or watch it, I hope you'll consider either way supporting the Origins Project Foundation, which produces this podcast and the many other things that we do to try and uh, discuss the most exciting things that are happening to humanity in the 21st century. Thanks again. With no further ado, Wendy Friedman. Well, thank you, Wendy Friedman, for coming on the program. I've wanted to have you on for so long. You are one of my favorite people and favorite scientists, and it's a great thrill to have you here. Well, thanks very much for your patience, Lawrence, <laughs> and I'm pleased to be here. Well, you know, um, this is going to be uh, a, um, a lot of fun because we're going to talk about some interesting issues that are really at the forefront of cosmology. And in fact, you've been at the forefront of observation of cosmology your whole career. But uh, this is the Origins podcast, and I want to begin with your origins. I'd like to find out what, how people got to the starting point of where they were for what we know them for. And I want to, I want to do that. And I've, I've, of course, it's been fun for me to learn a little more about you. I know we spent time together and talked with each other about our history, but I, I now know a little bit more. Um, I did not know that your parents spanned the two cultures, for example. Um, so your father was a doctor and your, uh, your mother was a concert pianist. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Uh, and I felt fortunate in that because my father really inspired and nurtured my interest in science. And my mother uh, really introduced me to the arts and literature. And, and it's just made for a very, you know, uh, a life that is, has been. A well-balanced individual. Yeah. Maybe that's one reason I like you so much. You're so well-balanced, <laughs> but, um, but I would have loved it if you'd said your mother nurtured your interest in science and your father 
in the arts. That would have even been more fun. Well, maybe the next generations that will happen. Yeah. But I know a lot of women scientists whose fathers were the ones who inspired them. And I think it's a very okay. common story. So yeah. you're so let's go. So you you grew up in Toronto where I grew up and, and you're just a little bit younger than me, but we maybe crossed paths somewhere in who that knows? time. But um, uh, and I won't ask where in Toronto because I'll ask you later. I was wondering where. But um, you're so. Did your father want you to be a doctor ever or did it was it just an interest in science or? I think I was very lucky that not everyone who has parents who say do what you love to do. And so he didn't push me to do anything, but he certainly was a supporter and it was unusual for a girl to be interested in science and for them to pursue it as a career. Yeah. And, 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 and my whole family was supportive. My grandparents thought I was stark raving mad. You know, why would a girl do that? And uh, <laughs> where, you, where, are you, where are your grandparents from? Uh, originally from Eastern Europe. Yeah, Eastern, I figured, but. Yeah, settled in, in Canada, and um, yeah, so I'm second generation Canadian, oh. then moved to the On US. both sides? Were your grandparents on both sides from Eastern Europe? Both sides, yeah. Oh, okay. And they probably wanted you to have a real profession. Um, yes, well, or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or not, exactly, or be a, be a yeah, housewife. What kind of doctor was your father? Or, he I was should... a psychiatrist, and the reason a psychiatrist. that he yeah, became a psychiatrist was that he was interested in human nature and interested in science himself, and, and that was a way for him to keep learning. Um, okay, when you, when you say your dad got you interested in science, I mean, in what sense? Did he talk to you about it? What, I mean, I'm assuming you read books or saw TV or what other things as well. He encouraged it, but in what way did he encourage it? I mean, do you like reading when you're younger? and? Oh, I loved reading. I read, you know, every book on the shelf on astronomy and, yeah. and uh, in the library. But he would do things like for my birthday, he would buy me a microscope. Um, mm -hmm. and the next year, he'd buy me a chemistry set. So yeah. I spent hours in our basement, you know, looking yeah. at stuff. Yeah, we all had chemistry sets. And did, did things and making yet terrible smelling things. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I loved it. And, you know, it, and for whatever reason, I didn't really care for dolls. And, and so he was still nurturing my interest in, in the things that was that your happened. mom at all interested in, did she have an interest in science at all or, or oh, no, I don't think so. I mean, and she's of course very pleased and, and interested in my career, but, but it, it certainly wasn't anything that was uh, an interest of hers. And that's why I think it, we really did have a nice balance. My father was really interested in science and he, you know, he was the one who introduced me to the night sky. We went to a, um, one summer was the first dark sky I had ever seen. And we were looking up and, uh, he was fascinated by astronomy and, and he told me about the light travel time, you know, looking wow. at these distant stars and, and, and the experience for me looking up at this really dark sky away from the lights in Toronto. I was going to say, if you're in Toronto, you don't see the night sky. No, no, that's right. <laughs> it's the I first time I've ever really seen the dark sky north of the city. And, and this idea that, you know, as he explained it, there might not be those stars that we were looking at. They might not be there anymore because they might have you know, gone long before the light reached us. And, and I just, it clearly stuck with me because. It had a yeah, big that's amazing. Well, that, I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, I mean either, as you, I think we know, you know, me, either my parents graduated high school, so I didn't get that from them. They wanted me to be a doctor and, mm -hmm. and very disappointed I didn't become one, but um, for a while. Uh, but, um, did, so, yeah, so and he also, you know, I, I really like math and I think it was just one of those things that the girls around me, we didn't have to continue math in high school in Toronto at that time. And most of the girls that I knew dropped it. Really? Um, yeah. But he, he, again, just sort of, he liked the fact that I was good at math, that I liked math. And, and I think you get a lot of messages in our culture and, and particularly girls that it, you know, math is hard and it's not for girls. And so it just really helps if you have people in your corner who are saying, gee, that's terrific that you like it. And it's terrific. Yeah, and it's not so hard if you're good at it and you work at yeah. it. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. So I, yeah, I feel very, very fortunate in that. Was he, was he, was he, was he born in Canada? He was. He, he, he was born in Toronto. Yeah, yes. Oh, he was born in Toronto. Did your mom? Did you? Do you play the piano? Did your mom? I play did the piano? play the piano. I played the piano till grade thirteen, which we had in Canada. And Me too. At that time, and and then you know, astronomy and astrophysics kind of won. I stopped practicing uh, by the time I got to university. But yeah, I actually did pretty well. I I I, I liked playing the piano. So but, you're musical as well. You got something from both of them. I did. I did. Okay. And you have siblings. I know of at least one. How many siblings do you have? 
I have two. I have one brother and one sister. I know for your sister. And and they, did, were you the only one to go into science? Yes. We all did very different things. So my sister went into literature. Yeah, I know she went. We're, we're the ones who joked that uh, between us, we have a balanced education. <laughs> <laughs> I went the science route. She went the literature and and uh, to humanities route. And my brother ended up in architecture and law. So very different. All oh, I expand. Okay, uh, excellent. Well, um, d so your father encouraged it. Did, what about, did, were there, did school have an impact? Did he have great teachers or was it, or is it one of those things where you're so motivated it didn't matter? All of the above. <laughs> I had great teachers. I had terrible teachers. You know, I had the opportunity to be bored to death in some of my classes. And, and then I had, uh, you know, really great and, and very supportive teachers too. So. Were the science teachers good or, or? Again, mixed. So yeah, me too. Um, it, it, I, yeah, I went to the public school system and in 10th grade, the physics teacher that I had, and, and you know, people don't believe this when I say this now, but it, he would be describing something to the class and he would get to a point where it would get a bit technical and he'd turn to us and say, the girls don't have to listen to this. Wow. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I it, never... it... Huh. Interesting. Maybe I wasn't aware of it. I mean, I'm, th I think I'm three years older than you and I. We both went to public school because in Canada, there really weren't many, at least when I grew up, I never even heard of a private school. Yeah, uh, I know I there were in downtown Toronto and stuff, but, but, it, yeah. you know, kids just went to public school. And, yeah, and, um, were good. And, and I think I did get on balance, a very good education. Yeah. Uh, me too. But it was, you know, there were some teachers who were just. You said, wow. The, yeah. I mean, I had a, a crappy physics teacher in a way, but it wasn't that that it wasn't, it, I don't remember him being sexist. He was just, uh. I think he was actually inspiring because it irritated me. <laughs> I thought it was, yeah. okay. and I, well, I, I was interested, so I did pay attention. Do you but, think he did that on purpose? Maybe no, not. I, no, he was definitely not. absolutely not. But then in in twelfth uh, grade, I was lucky to have a physics teacher who had actually gotten a master's in physics from Oxford, and he loved the subject. Uh, he was oh, a wow. fantastic teacher, and and he really encouraged a group of us to think and challenged us. And, and it was, for me, really the first experience I'd had of really being challenged. And, and I just really, really Oh, that's it. wonderful. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm that's... sure I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't taken his class. It was just- You know, it's funny. I, oh, that's great to hear. For me, it was a grade 13, some grade 13 class, but not in science, actually. It was in history, where mm -hmm. I learned how to write. I had a very mm -hmm. demanding teacher. We had to write an essay every week or two. And First print, demanding you know, teacher, print. the right kind of demanding, they're priceless. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then, and then, you know, those of us who were lucky enough to have grade 13 meant we went to university really prepared. At least I felt <laughs> that way. Yeah. Um, I do too. Uh, and okay. Well, you, you, uh, where in pub, you went, you say, you, was it downtown Toronto? Did you live or, or? It was a Vaughn Road Collegiate Institute. It, oh, it okay. I know where that is. Years ago. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. but then you decided to stay in Toronto to go to, go to university. Did you live at home when you went to? Uh, I lived at home as an undergraduate and then I lived in graduate residence. Well, I that's stayed. it. I was going to ask you, you, you did some, something that's somewhat unusual, not just staying at home in Toronto, but that's, I mean, University of Toronto had, had certainly one of the best uh, physics departments and probably astronomy departments. I don't know. But um, although I learned I, that you started out in biophysics, we'll get there in a minute. I want to find out what got, what caused you to go from one to the other. Cause it's interesting when you, you've talked so far, it's all been about stars and your father turning you, you know, to up up towards the sky. But I suspect biophysics may have been partly because your also father was a doctor, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you also stayed at the same place for graduate school, which isn't isn't that usual. So I want to talk about both those. First, why biophysics? Why did you want to do biophysics? Well, at that time, so I had figured out in high school that I wanted to do science. I knew I was headed to science and, and I really did enjoy bi biology. And I was very interested in uh, the question of memory. That was something that, that intrigued me. And I thought it would be a nice way of combining an interest in biology with my interest in, in physics. And so, yeah, when I entered University of Toronto, I that's where I thought I would head. But I took the uh, introductory astronomy and astrophysics course because I loved <laughs> astronomy. And, um, and then it turned out that the biology course, um, you may be familiar with Convocation Hall at the University of Toronto. That's uh -huh. where it was taught for oh, undergraduates. Okay. 
giant, I mean, a thousand seat um, yeah. auditorium. And it was mind numbing. It was just was it was dreadful. And and in in fact, the the lab for the course, they gave us a headset, and we had to go along, you know, with this headset and and do the lab. And the TAs for the course just struck me as bored as tears. <laughs> it's just it was so uninspiring. Which is, you know, I'm sure if I had ended up in biology, I would have been fascinated. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, it, look at biology today; it's just blossoming. Um, but it it was just really deadly. And the astronomy and astrophysics course was terrific. And, um, and fortunately, because I really liked physics, I took the upper level physics classes because I, um, I wanted to, I didn't need them for biophysics, yeah. but I had them. So it was easy They're always better. You know, I always tell people for some, I don't know if it, you found this, but I've always found. And I would, even when I was, when I was chairman of the department, I tried to make sure this wasn't the case, but most departments, most physics departments, when they have a physics course for engineers or a physics course for biologists, it's never the te it's never taught as well as a physics course for physicists. So I yeah. used to tell kids, even if you don't want to be a physicist, take the honors physics class because it's going to be better taught and yeah. more interesting instead mm -hmm. of just sort of people thinking, oh, the kids only need to know X, Y, or Z, and therefore we don't have to, you know, really understand things. So yeah, I, I guess that it's, it was a good choice for you to do that. Yeah. yeah. And also, again, although you're a little younger than me, you're not a lot younger. I wanted to be a doctor till about grade 12 when I, when I dropped biology and I dropped biology at the time for the same reason. The biology course was just memorizing parts of a frog and things. And it was just awful. But the, but part of that was just maybe the teacher and the course, but it was also that at the time, you know, biology, biology has blossomed. But at the time I, we didn't even know about DNA, I think at that time. And when, I mean, at least it hadn't filtered down to the high schools. And, yeah. um, and, and so it, 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 it didn't, it wasn't scientifically. I mean, now it is really, really blossom. Yeah. And, um, but I'm still interested in it. I'm surprised you've even had a biophysics program because it wasn't that big back then. I, um, you know, honestly, I don't even know if they had a biophysics program. I, I don't yeah. know that, but I never got that far. And oh, it, I see. in my family, nobody had gone to graduate school. I wasn't thinking. Yeah. Yeah. When I, got to University of Toronto, okay, I'm going to go on to graduate school. This is yeah. where I'm going to end up today sitting, you know, University of Chicago. And it just, it, it wasn't part of my thinking and I didn't know how to do it. And it wasn't till many years into the program where I realized and people were encouraging me to apply to graduate school, but I had no idea how to do that or yeah. what was involved. None, I mean, just didn't, no examples. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. Well, I, I knew enough at the time that, I, yeah, I didn't know about, I, I never, I knew some people that went to the U.S. later on to graduate, but the whole thought of, for undergraduate, but the whole thought of even that at the time, I never even thought it was a possibility to go to the U.S. And yeah. Graduate school, oh, yeah. I and I don't think they didn't encourage us either. And, yeah. you know, getting to how I ended up staying in Canada, I, I for graduate school, I, I applied to Yale because I was interested in star formation at the time yeah. in galaxies and Beatrice Tinsley was there and yeah. and where I later was, taught, so I know the people. Yeah. yeah, and and the people at Toronto were not encouraging me to apply to the US. They oh, and really? and when I got into Yale and but you know, it all I did was apply to Toronto and, and Yale. Yeah. And when I yeah. think of it now wow. and the numbers of places that people apply to. Yeah. Uh and and then there was you know they kind of fought over you know come here it's better here you go. Well, that's and, nice to be wanted. <laughs> I, I guess, but it was a little bit disconcerting yeah. at the time. And and you know you asked why I stayed, and and that was the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, <laughs> hands down, huh. was just being commissioned, and uh, in Hawaii you know fourteen thousand uh. feet, and the opportunity to observe there, and Yale didn't have observing facilities, so ah, so that was the reason. That. And that was another good choice. You know, not obvious, but a really good choice for me to. Well, and, to and at least and to, okay. While it is nice to experience it, I always tell I tell I tend to advise students to go to a different place to graduate school, just because it's good to see different institutions, different people, get it to experience the whole thing. But also, but Toronto is a heck of a lot nicer place to be than New Haven, having <laughs> an, a dismal. Yeah, you know, you don't know at the time, you make a decision and, you know, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it, it, it won't. But, but I, it's interesting. It, you had access, to, you know, a lot of access to a big telescope. And it's, that's it's interesting because my, when I was, when I graduated, I, I don't think any, um, see, I was interested in particle physics and fundamental theoretical physics and none of my professors 
even suggested I consider Canada at the time. It was a really yeah, and I, I think if it hadn't been for a CFHT, they just would have you know yeah yeah that's absolutely definitely would have gone to Yale. And then yeah. and then just one little aside. I know it's about you and not me, but I will. I did consider biophysics when I was in graduate school when I became very depressed, and I thought of doing a joint MD PhD. I was at MIT, and you could do a PhD at Harvard and or MD at Harvard and a PhD at MIT. And I thought, first of all, my mother would be so happy. But uh, <laughs> but it was interesting. But then, but, you know, and this was, again, it was around, probably around 1980 or so, maybe 78, 79, something like that. But I went to someone who was head of cell biology at Harvard, who was an uncle of a friend of mine. And he said, don't do biophysics because it's not of interest to biologists and it's not of interest to physicists. Interesting. And it's, it's changed dramatically. But at the that time, has, but it was true. Yeah. Yeah, it was true at the time. So you made the right choice. You, 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 well, it was, it, I've, it I've never world. regretted it. I've never looked back. And, you know, as I said, I'm sure I could have enjoyed a life, you know, a career in, in biology, but, but I've, I've really enjoyed my yeah, career. Not, well, it's great. And did you always, I guess in astronomy, I guess, yeah, there really aren't, there really weren't, I mean, there aren't many, there are theoretical astronomers and I know some, but I mean, you always want, you wanted to look in the telescopes. You always wanted to, is that, I, my heart is, I, you know, actually part of me, uh, I don't know. I, I think both are important. You know, you often yeah. have people who are arguing. It's an area where you can you do a little bit of both. Not like need, you need both, right? And yeah. They're both really important aspects coming at things from a different way. But um, yeah. Actually, let me ask you about that because I, again, I don't think the public realize that in the field that I was in, which is theoretical particle physics, there's no way you could do experimental particle physics and, and theoretical particle physics. I mean, I mean, Fermi was the last person who probably did you know, experimental and theoretical nuclear physics, but there's just so much baggage and, you know, intellectual baggage of building machines and intellectual baggage of mathematics. You can't do it. But I think in astronomy, you can do it. You, you, it's easier to bring. I mean, it's of course like all fields that have evolved the specialties, but you yeah. could do, you could do some, you know, theoretical work while you're, do, you know, doing observing, which is be a, a yeah, while I was in graduate school, I mean, one of the things that I got the opportunity to do was to work with Ray Carlberg, and he was, no, I was in graduate school, um, and uh, so we did some n-body simulations to add gas into an n-body code, and uh, that was a really fun project, and I enjoyed it, but it's sort of like piano, like once you get going in something, and I sort of took the observational route, um, yeah, you know, I, I just, uh, I really enjoyed it, and 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 I think, again, you know, you can you, there are people who do both. Yeah. And, Did you uh, go? So when you were graduate school, you went to CFHT or uh, uh, I went to you, CFHT a lot. Yeah. Been, yes, uh, kind of France Hawaii telescope. So that must have been fun as a graduate student. Oh yeah, yeah, it was terrific. Um, yeah, that was in the days. Stuck people, at the prime, that was the days of prime focus cages. <laughs> yeah, and people would actually be in the same building they were observing in, right back then. Yes. Oh yeah, we go to the summit at fourteen thousand feet, right? Yeah. 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 And people don't. No, no, I'm glad to have had the opportunity to do that. And people I'm just, don't do that anymore, right? I'm such an ignoramus, but people just, yeah, they're down at no, sea level. Down at sea level, and of course, now we can be anywhere in the world, right? I observe yeah. from you know here, same place. Yeah. <laughs> so well, and one. since you're using, the, and we'll talk about using the Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, those are two telescopes you're definitely not nearby when you're using. You're yeah. using, and and yeah. so that, that's the way it, it is. A lot. Yeah. So you. You moved to 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 uh, Carnegie at uh, in, in Pasadena uh, right away to do your postdoc right after after I don't know and then stayed there for much of your career until you yeah. yeah, thirty time. years, um, and uh, why there? Uh, for observational astronomy, I don't think there was a better place in the world to be. <laughs> we oh. had access to the 200-inch telescope, which, you know, at the time was the largest telescope in the world, and access to the 100-inch telescope at Las Campanas in Chile, and uh, people who were, you know, phenomenal. So, yeah, it was my first choice, hands down. Hands down, and and obviously their first choice, too. Um, and, uh, but then... Could I, but then you couldn't use the telescope you'd already worked on because now you're at a new place, right? But it doesn't matter. They let me use it for a while. <laughs> okay. So I didn't know how it worked. For a I, while. I didn't know how it worked in the point. <laughs> okay. But I mean, look, I've known, I mean, you're most well known for leading the, the, Hubble, the, 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 the key project of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to measure the Hubble constant. Had, had measuring, obviously that's, 
actually I've, I've said this, I don't know if I've ever said in print, but Feynman used to, you know, was once asked, what's the most important, if you had to know one number, you know, and he might, I don't know if it was the fine structure constant, but I've always said it's the Hubble constant in a way, because that one thing determines basically all the properties of our universe. I mean, on larger scales. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously the important, most important number to know. And, and to put things in perspective, when you were, when you were starting and when I was a young professor at Yale, um, there were measurements, the Hubble constant, and it was either a hundred plus or minus five or 42 plus or minus five, which automatically as an outsider, you know, I came into astronomy as an outsider, made me suspicious of error estimates in, in the field because, you know, these two fields that, you know, and all of us said, well, if it's a hundred or, you know, 50, it's gotta be 75 and tended out to be close to that. Um, so the field has changed a lot. Um, and, and in fact, I never really quoted him by name, but I will because he went to Carnegie and might have been director before you, uh, Gus Omler, mm -hmm. um, was my colleague at Yale. And didn't he move to become director there? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. But he, when I was a young assistant professor and I'd come and talk to him because, you know, and and, and I was, as I say, a, a theoretical physicist and, and he, and I'd be, we'd be talking about measuring the Hubble constant or, or Omega or any, and he said to me, Nature will always conspire, so you'll never ever be able to measure any of the fundamental constants <laughs> in cosmology. <laughs> That's interesting. They'd always, up to that point, what it always happened is people made claims like 42 or 100, and it was systematic uncertainties that always screwed you up. Same measuring a flat universe, measuring an open universe, always, you know, with definitively these wonderful new measurements, but then you discover there'd be systematics. Or things you, you didn't. I, know. I'm not sure it's that different now, but I think you know what we're arguing about are much smaller differences and much smaller level errors. But we still have to worry about the systematics. Absolutely. And, I mean, the point is an observation. You can't twiddle the dials like you can an experiment. And yeah. the reason I'm stressing this is going we're going to get to it because people are arguing about one percent or two percent uncertainties. And my, you know, when people ask me about it, I I say, well, I'm an old guy and I grew up when there's a factor of two uncertainty. Uh, you know, but each one would. Uh, each person would, um, each group would be convinced that they were right to a few percent. And so I'm always a little skeptical. But but getting things to fine details is really where the hard work has been involved in. And that's been much of your career. Yeah. Had What got you interested in, so early on, you were interested in star formation. Is that what you did when you went to, uh, to Carnegie? No, by that time I was interested in uh, in, in Cepheids and the distance scale and implications for cosmology, so, and and that happened. What got you interested in that is what I wanted to ask. What got you maybe yeah. in that direction? So, so when I started observing with Canada France Hawaii Telescope and with my interest in star formation, it was to study the the high mass end of the initial mass function in nearby galaxies so galaxies that were close enough to actually resolve individual stars mm -hmm. and it was a field that people had measured in some cases you know literally only 20 stars and they were measuring a mass function and so another field that was you know big error bars people arguing about yeah. whether there was a universal initial mass function and so on you know the distribution of stars as they form yeah. uh, with mass and and so and I lived through the the transition between photographic plates, which is what the Canada France Hawaii Telescope started with. Oh. It had a really big field of view, so a degree on the sky, which is an unusually big field. So yeah. you could get things like the Andromeda Galaxy almost entirely on a plate. Uh, that one was even a little bigger, but most of the nearby galaxies yeah. you could you could measure. And then when CCDs started to become available in the nineteen eighties, early nineteen eighties in order to calibrate the photographic plates, I took CCD images uh, in these nearby galaxies and rather than just point in some random place, it was, okay, let's look at the Cepheids in these galaxies. And what happened, so this was the last year of my thesis, it, measuring the period luminosity relation for Cepheids and using Cepheids that had been discovered by Hubble or um, Vada and, and earlier astronomers, the beauty of Cepheids is they keep changing, you know, their variability. Um, you can measure them now, even though they were discovered a long time ago, unlike yeah. the supernovae, which go off once and you're done. So, yeah. you know, you come at them with different instrumentation. We're observing some of the same ones now with James Webb. But 
it was the first time that it was possible to make measurements at more than one wavelength, or at least accurately, there's been some in the visual. So in the blue filter, the visual filter, and the near infrared I and, and R band filters. And then what turned out to be the case was that if you measured the apparent distance modulus as a function of wavelength, they weren't the same. The galaxy was clearly at one distance, but when you plotted them as a function of the inverse wavelength, it turned out to have the same functional form as the interstellar extinction law. You were seeing the effects of reddening by dust. Okay. And it was the first time that it became possible to make a correction then for the interstellar dust. And that was one of the reasons why there had been this factor of two. That, and you could, you could do that better with CCDs than with... Um than with, when, with photographic plates. Yeah, the photographic plates were sensitive to the B-band. That's what people were measuring with. They weren't getting mm. multi-wavelength data. Mm. And so okay. that was the first time that it became possible to make a correction. Okay, I want to step that's us... what we use with the key project and use it today. Okay, and that's, I mean, this is of very great importance. And so I want to step back a little bit for the for the listener who may not know what a Cepheid is, what extinction is, what um, uh, uh, distant modulus is. So, because these are going to be coming, these are... These are important concepts, and 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 it was around when it went and CCDs first came in around about the time you say when you were getting your doing your eighty two eighty three is when they came to CFHT and I think started to become available at Teratololo and Kitt Peak. It's interesting because I guess photographic plates were still used. I remember I I became a professor at Yale in eighty five, and someone I knew, Margaret Geller, used to come down. Yale must have had a big repository of photographic plates because M Margaret Geller would come down from Harvard to use them. So, mm. you know, you went to where there were repositories and, um, and, uh, um, and so they were still being in that would have been in the, in at least 85, 86, 87, 88. So the transition must've been relatively still. still. In the 80s. Yeah. 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 And by the end of the eighties, you know, the transition had completely taken place. Okay. There were no more and it was, you know, and people, you, it was amazing. There were these machines that read these plates, some yeah. of which had well, been I around for years and years and years and years. Right. I spent two summers at Cambridge when I was a graduate student and, and used an automatic plate measuring machine there that had been developed by Ed Kibblewhite. Yeah. It was great. It was fun. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it must, yeah, it must've been amazing to be able, it's still weird for me to think that, and I guess it's been useful. Some people have gone back and looked at old plates to be able to compare to new things to see for transients and other things. Of course, mm -hmm. you have the problem that the, as you say, the calibration between those things and, oh, that, you know, and that's what I had the chance to do was to actually do the transformation between the photographic photometry and the CCD photometry, which was linear, right? The photons in yeah. were uh, directly proportional to the electrons you measured yeah. and the electronic signal. And, and so uh, the light levels, low light levels for photographic plates, they're just, you know, that just unreliable and, and the, uh, it, where they were bright, they were saturated. It was, it was, you know, the photographic photometry had a lot of problems. Okay. So now it made it better. Okay. So now I want to go back for people who don't know why Cepheids are important. Why were Cepheids important? Let's go through the history of this. So the short answer is that they, for the first time, allowed you to measure accurate distances to galaxies. So if you want to go back in time, if you go to before Edwin Hubble, Mm -hmm. We didn't know uh, what the distances to what people called nebulae were at the time. So these were, there were regions on photographic plates that had spiral-like features. And uh, they had been known, so you know, many of them had names, Messier with a number behind them. So M31 mm -hmm. is Messier 31, the Andromeda galaxy. And, and the question was, were these objects that might be within our Milky Way, regions of star formation, gas and dust that might be condensing mm -hmm. to form new stars? Or were they like the Milky Way itself at greater distances? And so there was a great debate in 1920, the National Academy of Sciences, and, and, and we didn't know. I mean, there was just no way of gauging. You could... Mm -hmm. It was a star faint because it was far away or, you know, was a star bright because it was nearby. We didn't know. So Henrietta Leavitt, who was an astronomer working at the Harvard College Observatory in the 1920s, uh, she was measuring stars in what turned out to be one of our nearest neighbor galaxies, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Mm -hmm. and what she noticed was that some of the stars were varying in their brightness. And when she uh, looked closely, it turned out some of these stars were uh, increasing in brightness pretty quickly and then uh, leveling off more slowly. 
And that was a characteristic shape of something that had been known, a type, type of star, a variable star called the Cepheid variable. And we'd known about those since the 1700s. Since 1700. Yeah, yeah. What she discovered was that there was a relationship between how bright these Cepheids were and how fast they were changing in their luminosity, their period of variation. So what that ultimately meant was that if you could measure the period, how rapidly the star was changing and its apparent brightness, then if you could measure the brightness of a, of a Cepheid, say in the Milky Way by some other more accurate technique, then you'd know how tr intrinsically bright the Cepheid was at a given period. So then you go to another object like the Large Magellanic Cloud, you measure how apparently bright they are and at a given period, and then you just compare it so that you use the inverse square law of light. Light falls off, the intensity of light falls off as the square of the distance from us. And so there was suddenly a way of measuring the distances. And that's what Edwin Hubble used when he discovered that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way. That's how he discovered it, was making use of this Levitt law. And, and then Hubble went on to discover that it, when he used velocities that had been measured by Vesto Slipher, in Arizona, and uh, plotted those velocities versus distance, there was then a correlation between velocity and distance. And the implication of that, add in Einstein's general theory of relativity, was that, okay, the universe is actually expanding uh, galaxies in the past. Um, uh, as the universe was expanding, they would have been closer and closer together in the past if the universe is expanding now. And uh, with uh, Einstein's theory led to this picture of a Big Bang universe, a universe that began in a hot phase and has been expanding. And, and, the, and the expansion um, you know, was eventually con confirmed with the uh, discovery of the background radiation in microwaves in the 1960s. Well, but that wasn't known at that time. Well, but and, and indeed, it, it, as yeah. you know, Hubble, of course, knew he'd measured that, but didn't, I don't know if he, well, for a long time, he didn't believe it had anything to do with expansion. Uh, he was very careful. He, he yeah. wasn't so sure that it actually had yeah. cosmological implications. Yeah. And just, and again, just to put this in perspective of how much has changed, I mean, I've looked at Hubble's data and it's nice to say there's a correlation. I often tell people if, if, a, if you had a first year physics lab and you, drew a straight line through that data set and, and you might not, you might not be past it. Um, it was certainly noisy and, 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 you know, with the straight line guides the eye, but it wasn't clear that it was the best thing to do. It was kind of lucky, but he also, but just to make it clear, he got the number wrong by a factor of 10, almost a yeah. factor eight or so it's compared to now. Seven. So, yeah. so, and so, you know, things have changed. Yeah. But it's and that comes back, it comes back to the photographic photometry and not being able to correct for dust and yeah. not having enough galaxies to measure, um, which Hubble, the Hubble, the space telescope allowed us to do. Yeah. And that's one, that's another one of the terms he used about reddening. And, and that the point is that, that, you know, you're absolutely right. Brightness is, is a great measure of distance unless there's a cloud between you and the object. And then it's not such a good, you know, then brightness is not such a good. So you got to know what's between you and the object. And that and and that's and how can you know you're not out there? Well, you know you're looking at light, and the stuff that it's going through will absorb in certain frequencies differently. And therefore, if you see more absorption, I guess, in the red end, then you know it's going through more dust, right? You know, more in the blue end, right? More so it turns out. Sorry, it look redder. Yeah, yeah, it look redder. The, the dust grains, uh, the size of the dust grains, actually comparable to the wavelength of blue light, and so that it gets scattered and absorbed. But the long wavelength red light sort of goes through you know, hardly well seen. actually now that i mean that's the same reason we tell people that the sky is blue and when you look at sunset the oh, sun yeah. looks red because you're looking through more of the atmosphere it's exactly the same argument more or less uh yes. you're looking through more of the atmosphere yeah. and the blue's been filtered out and you look up it's been scattered down um and so it's the same in the in the in the in the, in the galaxy but one when, when it comes to talk, you mentioned so the period luminosity relationship with Cepheids was fundamental. But of course, in order to calibrate that, you have to be able to have another way of measuring the distance to a Cepheid, right? And you can't, because you have to know, you have to know, you know, you have to know the zero point, right? right. And right. how, and how's that determined? So now we, we have the advantage that uh, we have 
parallax measurements for Cepheids. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't uh, something that Hubble or early astronomers had access to. But now with satellites like Gaia, the European satellite, so, you know, you can measure the position of a Cepheid. So as the Earth is revolving about the sun, you're looking at a distant star from different angles as you're going through the annual orbit of the Earth. And so you can literally use high school geometry uh, to, you know, measure angles and, and get a distance. And parallax and it, for people, again, you know, if you just, if I'm looking at you on this screen, if I close one eye or the other, you jump yes. back and forth, but the back of the room doesn't change as much. And, right. and because, the, and, and the baseline is the width distance between my eyes and, uh, and, and the earth, you have baseline, you know, June versus December yeah. or whatever. And, uh, but you say that wasn't available then. I, no. I when no, was it, when, well, you know, when it started to be available? Well, so the first sort of more reliable measurements for Cepheids, at least, so you, you had some stars, the first, you know, stars that had parallax measurements is, I think, 1851 by Bessel, right? It took yeah. a long time to, yeah. but for Cepheids, um, you know, they're rare, they're super giants. It took a long yeah. time to be able to get accurate enough measurements to, to measure uh, for the Cepheid distance scale. And, and those are still being refined and, and. I think the ultimate goal of Gaia is to get 1% parallaxes. You still have to worry about reddening by dust, by the way. Yeah, so it, yeah. they measure parallaxes, not distances. But um, And there have been some calibration issues that have been hard to overcome. But that will come 1920, 19, is, that one of the, is one of the chief uncertainties in when you get distances to Cepheid? Yes, that... yes, it is. And, and there aren't many opportunities to measure parallaxes so, or get a geometric distance. You can use stars in the Milky Way. You can use stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which was, you know, the, uh, the galaxy that Henrietta Leavitt studied. And there's another galaxy, NGC 4258. And those three are the main anchors now for the zero point, for the calibration of the distance scale and the Hubble constant. But they're just nature hasn't given us very many nearby objects that you have really accurate measurements for. And that's one of the remaining uncertainties. And now, where when, when Henry Edward Levitt did this, it was purely phenomenological. We use the word phenomenological. When, namely, it was discovered to be there, but people didn't know why. They I, didn't even know that the Cepheids were pulsating. Yeah. Right? It, now, it, yeah. I was going to ask, though, it's always nice to have a theoretical understanding of something you're using at the fundamental basis to measure the universe. Are Cepheids now, is that period luminosity relationship extremely well understood now, theoretically? Uh, the extremely well, I, I think, probably doesn't fit. We okay. can't start yet from first principles and use, you know, just ordinary <laughs> physics and and say, you know, we have a Hubble constant to 1% and predict that. Uh, the stars are pulsating. They have and atmospheres. Or again, we have to worry about scattering. By... How do we know that they're pulsating and have atmospheres now? Is that is that theoretical or is it? Can you? I mean, how do you know they're pulsating? It's it's both. So theoretically, you know, the um, I'm I'm actually trying to remember now. So it was, um, and I'm trying to remember who did this. I think it was Sha yeah, almost certainly was Shapley who showed that it was pulsation, um, and. Uh, and I just not remembering in the moment what it was exactly that led him to rule out all the other, because there's a whole long list of possibilities yeah. of what yeah. the area. Yeah. Um, but they are definitely pulsating. And, you know, we can see how the radial velocities track. I mean, that's the other way now yeah. we have, we can measure radial velocities. We see where the star is actually moving in and out. So yeah. I don't remember his argument, but but we can see this empirically. So you can now see that you can actually see the chain, the oscillations in the, in the radio yeah. velocity using the Doppler effect. So you see the front of the star moving back and forth yeah. as it, as it, okay. So that, that's important. So, yeah. I mean, I'm asking all these questions. It may sound like it's too, it's, it's a little detailed and technical, but, but, it, but these are important questions because of, of, of the consequences and the yeah. fact that, so your interest in Cepheids was, you know, obviously to measure these accurately and um and yeah as you say you know the hubble constant impacts everything we do in cosmology and so there was this factor of two uncertainty when i started and me. and and so yeah it was a question that really intrigued me and, and continues to this day because now there are other reasons to make more accurate measurements and and, when, and you know it's uh, it, this is really so but uh, you you became you headed the Hubble, the, the Hubble Space Telescope key project to measure the Hubble constant. When so, Hubble was launched when? What year? I forget now. Isn't that awful? I sh 
1990, but it was supposed to be launched in 1986. And so you started, you became a postdoc around 84 or something like that? Postdoc in 84. And then I joined the Carnegie uh, professional staff in 87. So you, so, so the Hubble was on everyone's mind. So you were already looking forward and planning to use Hubble, even when you were a postdoc, I assume. Yeah. So uh, somebody asked me this the other day, you know, how did the, the key projects come about? And it yeah. was, you know, that was interesting, too, because it was Ricardo Giacconi, who was the director at that time of the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh-huh. And he uh, wanted to make sure that that what was unique to Hubble would could get done by the Hubble Space yeah. Telescope. And it, you know, he knew that if he gave um, a time allocation committee, which is you know the group that will decide the allocation of yeah. time on the telescope, um, people would have been waiting for decades to get access to the telescope. He knew it was going to be oversubscribed, and so he formed a committee to decide what were the most important projects that Hubble could do. And uh, there were three projects that were selected, and extragalactic distance scale was one of them. And um, there was a, a medium deep survey and there was a quasar project. And he invited the community to propose for the key projects. And, and we did. And at the time it, in uh, 84, I think this was, maybe it was 83, um, but Mark Aronson was the leader of the group. And uh, he, uh, tragically, Mark was killed in an accident at Kip Peak Observatory in 1987. And so by the time, oh, so then the Challenger accident happened in 1986 and Hubble was the due to be on the next shuttle. So everything got set back after that. And, uh, and so the telescope wasn't launched until 1990. And then the sphere collaboration, the problem with the focus of the telescope yeah. was discovered. So it didn't start getting data that was, you know, high resolution until December 93. Wow, that's- so that's a, almost a decade after you had begun. Now let me see. So yeah, so I forgot that Mark Her- who I, Mark Harrison died. He so he was the first head of that. The the yeah, I was uh, his deputy. You were his deputy, and yeah, it's a tragic. The but first um, one. let's let's go back. And uh, there are two things I want to then ask about the science, and then about your career. One thing you also mentioned, I I just want to go back to it because you mentioned it, and people are going to be puzzled by this thing called apparent distance modulus. Do you want to you want to want to explain that too? When you uh, okay, so distance modulus is, is it's an arcane term <laughs> that yeah. is a, a logarithmic measurement of the distance. Yeah, and it's and it's based on and yeah, sorry, there are different ways of measuring distance modulus, right? Yes, and and so with the Cepheids, what we do is we measure how apparently bright a Cepheid is, and then uh, having determined what its intrinsic or its absolute magnitude is another mm. logarithmic measurement of the of the brightness um, the difference between the apparent and the absolute magnitude is what we call the distance modulus but put simply it's a logarithmic measurement of distance it's a different it, it's basically tells you the difference between how bright it appears and how and how bright it actually is and a, a star that has a given brightness is a lot less bright when it's farther away so right. this is a lot this is a mathematical way of just trying to calibrate the relationship between how bright it actually is and how bright it you see it. Right. And then, and as you say, you have to be worried because things can get a little dimmer, not because they're farther away, but because there's stuff between you and them. Right. All the things that, all the bugaboos of, of right. observational so astronomy. Dust in the interstellar medium and metals, astronomers call metals anything heavier than hydrogen and helium, which is, but you know, those are in the atmosphere. They also scatter um, radiation. So these are the kinds of things we have to worry about that it can be systematic and, and cause problems when we're trying to. Okay. Regulate. Two things. Uh, one, one question of it's a personal one. And then I want to go to Hubble, why it was good to measure, why you, why you need to go to Hubble and not, and not the earth. You're sort of already mentioned one, but um Young scientists are worried about getting permanent positions for obvious reasons, and um, and uh, you were a postdoc working on a project, starting to work on a postdoc in a project in 1984, and it didn't even and and the Hubble Space Telescope didn't even, you know, begin to get science till what 1993. You're saying basically, yeah. We so started. How, how did you how did you survive as a scientist in the interim? 
uh, well, there was plenty to do. In, in fact, it turned out to be really important in terms of learning how to best do the observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. And and, and actually, I'm grateful for the that there was a time in between. So, you know, we were talking about CFHT, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. One of the projects that I took on as a postdoc was to try and understand whether metallicity, the, the abundance of these cepheids affected the luminosity. Because again, if you're trying to measure an accurate distance and, and you have a different metallicity for your calibrator than you do for the galaxy you're measuring, you're going to get the distance wrong. And, 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 and just, I'm just going to interrupt one more time, just so people know, stars have different abundances of different, you know, depending upon where they come from, what, what gas cloud they collapse from, they can have different abundances at some level of all of all you know of all the elements, and that's that's right. Yeah. And within a galaxy, there's more star formation in the center. There's just more activity, mm. and so more metals get thrown back out. So these stars expel their metals after they die, mm. and the new stars that form are you know have these metals in them. And so the idea was to look as a function of the distance from the center of the Andromeda galaxy. This was these were observations made at CFHT. Mm. And correct for reddening now for the dust mm -hmm. using this multi wavelength observations and see whether there was something left over, a difference that could be attributed to, to the metal abundance. Oh, I see. We knew that all the Cepheids were at the same distance. They're all in the same galaxy. And so uh, that was the first test that was done for metallicity. And we repeated the test with Messier 101 and 101 with the key project. And, and we're still. You know, to this day in the literature, people are arguing about how important is this effect of metallicity. It's a how tough thing important to is the effect? <laughs> we don't actually know. We <laughs> really don't know it to one or two percent. Um, yeah, that people have that's different. A, I mean, you know, that's yeah. the, that's the that's the point of you know we're talking about one or two percent, and there's so many things you have to try and understand. It's really amazing. It's amazing yeah. people like you can do it. I'm not, I was going to say amazing that we can do it, but it's unfair because it makes me seem like I'm <laughs> all right, but I certainly couldn't. But Well, it's interesting because, you know, our technology has completely changed and we're now using infrared instrumentation yeah. and we've got this beautiful facility, James Webb, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And, you know, the, it, the ability to, to actually get to the bottom of these things now is so different than when I started. Yeah. And it's, 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 I mean, the whole thing, the, who would have thought when we were, young i'm going to say that together for you too but i mean <laughs> i've never well i would never have thought we knew the hubble cons we know that flat the density yeah. of the universe all these things to you know accuracy that it's unfathomable when my you know i never thought in the early part of my career that these things would ever be known it's really an ama amazing how the revolutions in the in the yeah. field is taking place. And it's how I feel now. I think we've made this enormous progress. And at some level, we haven't stopped to actually appreciate the progress, right? I mean, maybe yeah. we don't have it to 1%, but if we have it to a few percent, look at the distances that we're covering. I, it's ama it's amazing. You can measure the universe at this level. Exactly. And, 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 and the other thing I try and emphasize as a theorist, especially, is that science is an empirical field. And, and what drives the progress every now and then, you know, new computers help and all of that. What drives the process is new instruments and yeah. new, when you turn on a new instrument, not only do you have a new window on the universe, but you're often surprised. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that leads me to the next question. What is it about the Hubble space telescope then that makes it better to do this stuff than earth based telescopes? Well, you get above the Earth's atmosphere, yes. and the Earth's atmosphere is uh, an annoyance. Uh, it's turbulent, and so the light that's coming to us from these distant stars, as it's coming through the atmosphere, it gets smeared. And so the resolution that you have um, from ground-based telescopes, and certainly when we started, it was about a factor of 10 better when we went to Hubble. Now we have techniques called adaptive optics that weren't available mm -hmm. then. We can do somewhat better, but not over a wide field. And so, uh, it, that, so it, once you have the better resolution, you can then see Cepheids more clearly against the background of the stars that they and reside separate, in. Uh, separate the brightness from the Cepheid from the background around it. Right. And get a more accurate measurement again of the brightness, which is what you need to measure the yeah. distance. And, and that also means that you know, your resolution is 10 times better. The volume that you can cover is a thousand times bigger. And yeah. the, so the supernovae, which now has become the, the favored the best method for stepping out into the distant what we call hubble flow yeah. um there were no calibrators when hubble was launched there just weren't any galaxies near enough to measure cepheids where they had also had type 1a supernovae. supernovae 
And so it just opened up the volume of galaxies that were accessible. And, and, and then we had CCDs on Hubble and we could take advantage of the multi-wavelength capability and yeah. So, and more galaxies. It was a, it, yeah. And it, it um, so the key project itself officially began when? I guess officially, uh, I would say 1990. Well, I, what do you call official? I mean, we, we came together as a group. In, the, the collaboration was formed in 1990, basically. No, it was formed after Giacconi got us together. There was a yeah. meeting in Aspen in either 83 or 84. And that was the nucleus of the group that got together. Then Challenger happened. And, and then we uh, put in a proposal in for 1990. And we observed two nearby galaxies, M81 and M M101 with the sphere collaboration but then in 1993 the telescope had the uh, uh, corrective optics and and that that's when we really got going and and the definitive i'm trying to remember the paper that you know the the there was the quote-unquote final key project paper was that like in early 2000 wasn't it 2001 yeah. 2001 so was it so it was based on almost a decade of not quite of observing yeah it was and, a decade. Um, and that gave the famous number 72 for this Hubble? With a 10% uncertainty. With and 10%. That, that had been our goal, which at the time seemed almost unattainable uh, because we were looking at this factor yeah, of two. Yeah. But we did design the program very deliberately to use five different methods. And the numbers of galaxies that we used for each method was uh, set to give us a statistical uncertainty for each of those measurements at the 5% level. level. And we, our, our feeling was that in order to get uh, the systematics and yeah. get at the systematics and get a robust estimate yeah. of the yeah. overall systematics, that that's what we needed to do. And, and, and we did make and you, a measurement. You, and you did that. And it and has, you know, it's, it's, it's survived over time, right? Since that time, the Cepheid calibration of the Hubble constant has really remained quite constant. Yeah. In fact, we're going to get there. I see. I, I was just looking at a paper that's coming out of yours um but um and it's still about the same um the uh and that by the way 72 was uh, that was what the number that was so amusing for us who are observing from the outside because there was the 50 crowd and the 100 crowd and we figured 75 and we thought here you did all this all this work for 10 years and i could have told you if, <laughs> if two groups were measuring 50 and 100 it was going to come out at 75 plus or minus a few so it seemed to me like a lot of work to come up with what it seems to be the obvious answer. Well, it's always good to rely on data. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's always good to rely on data. It was nice to see that the data came out the way it should anyway. And um, and so that was great. And all, everyone was happy. And that gave us, an, you know, well, that more or less happy. That gave us an age of the universe. And as you know, I spent a lot of my time worrying about the age of the universe when, and what it might do for cosmology and, and ultimately arguing that it argued for... Uh, uh, cosmological constant, among other things. But that was a fundamental point because the expansion rate of the universe gives you the age and many other things. And it was essential. But then along, so the Hubble, the, the big, the big, I mean, there have been many instruments. And I don't want to put anyone down, but Hubble was one of the biggies. The other big thing that changed cosmology again in the early 1990s was the discovery of, of measurements in the cosmic microwave background that you could actually see fluctuations that were inherent in the, in that that were around the universe when it was three hundred thousand years old, and that between the Hubble and that that changed cosmology. That changed it and turned it from an art to a science in a way. I mean, obviously people thought they were doing science before, but but now you could measure things incredibly accurately and do statistical analysis and get lots of data and not just one data point or other things. And and so you know that changed a lot of things. That you know, again as it. it allowed us to go back and try and understand the early universe and 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 and, and after after the initial Kobe satellite uh, there was been many other satellites that measure the cosmic microwave background and you measure things to three or four decimal place accuracy it's kind of amazing temperature and other things and 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 we won't go there but of course it allows you to measure other well it allowed you to measure the other cosmological parameters incredibly accurately like the density of the universe and whether the flatness of the universe and and the and also the abundance of how much dark matter there might be and how much normal matter there might be but it also allowed you to measure not directly measure the hubble constant but it allowed since you since the way the way we get from the early universe to now is gravity it may sound simple you know gravity 
but you start with these very small lumps and they end up being galaxies and stars. And in principle, if you know enough, you can try and extrapolate from back there to, to here. And, and the good thing is that when you try and do that with dark matter and, 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 and uh, this cosmological constant or this in, in dark energy, and you use the theory, you come up with a universe that looks today like the universe we see, more or less. I mean, and there were a lot of bumps in, in that road. And a lot of times when people said, we've ruled it out, you know, compared to numerical simulations, it's wrong. And then you find out the numerical simulations are wrong. And I've been through, you know, we've all lived through that. I've, I've, I've often said that, you know, dark matter has, uh, has non baryonic dark matter has, has been reborn many times. It's been a savior and saviors are always, re, uh, you know, are, are <laughs> reborn. But, uh, but it did allow you not just to do that, but to also infer what you might measure to be the Hubble constant today. And when that was done, and I don't know when the tension, I forget what was year now, when that was done, the, or, so the, the, time, what was it? the original, so uh, W map, of course, uh, yep. was the first satellite, you know, all sky uh, measurements of the microwave background. And, and they got a value of 71, I think, in 2003. Okay. So there was this brief period, as you say, where things looked like they agreed. Well, everything came together. Yeah, that, they, independently, they came up with 71. Everything, it seemed like grand synthesis was in the air. And then yeah. came, I guess, the the, the successor of the Planck, the Planck satellite. Yeah, and that was 2013. They came out with their first results. And, and they came down to 67 with a smaller error bar. Yes. And so, it, I, you know, it's hard to remember when you're as old as me. You know, it seems like yesterday. But 2013, uh, a decade ago, suddenly there seemed to be 67 and 72. And 72... At that, well, at 72, it had already come down from 10%. By 2013, what was the uncertainty? In so it was, you know, three to five percent. There was some disagreement about how low it had come down, but you know, so 72 had... plus or minus two or three, and then yeah. 67. I don't know what their quoted error bars and Planck were. Well, by the time of Planck 2018, it became, uh, you know, 67.4 plus or minus 0.5. So it was it was better than one percent precision. And that was new in cosmology when you use the term Hubble constant and 1% precision in the same sentence. Yeah. And it, it really, I think it was good. It focused the, the community that's working on the local distance scale to think hard about how to improve it. But it also set a challenge, which I think it, is It enormous. became known as the Hubble tension and some people pushed it more than others. But so since 2018, I, I you know, five or six years now, people said, hey, one measure way of measuring this gives you 68 or 69, I think now, I don't know what the number is. It's somewhere in that plus or minus less than one. Right. And then you've got 72 plus or minus a few. And, and that's a, a huge crisis. Again, I would smile because I'd say I grew up when it was too, you know, and, 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 and my assumption was that they're systematics always. It's, it's the problem, but some people have argued, including, you know, some of our mutual colleagues, um, people who measure supernovas in particular, one of them, um, um, had argued, look, this demonstrates that we need, there's something fundamentally wrong with cosmology. And, and you've had to deal with it. I get asked all the time, you know, it, you know, is, does this mean the Big Bang isn't true? And of course, I'd have to say, no, that's not what it means. But, but I used to say, look, I, 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 uh, when it comes to these differences, they're so important, if true, that you've got to get it right. But my suspicion is, it's systematics. I don't think mostly because it's also from a theoretical perspective, very hard. What you'd have to do to reconcile those two numbers by putting in some new physics, it, it, uh, you know, well, that, twice, that has turned out to be exceedingly hard, right? It, it's exceedingly are, hard. And moreover, it's one of those things where, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And, it, and the papers that are written to try and reconcile them are beautiful to the authors of the papers, but not beautiful to anyone who reads them as far as I'm concerned. That was my impression anyway. Um, but it's been a major problem and it's in on the news and everything else. And well, you know, I agree with you. It's an extremely important problem. And if it's right, we need to understand it. And, and, and this is the way you would check our, you know, what is now the standard model of cosmology, right? You would make a measurement at high redshift, 380,000 yeah. years after the Big Bang. You have this model, which is a predictive model that tells you today it ought to be 67. Yeah. And you can measure it today. So, you know, you can, you can test the yeah. model. And if they don't match, it's, 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 it, it, right. I mean, so it's right a, now they're not 
hitting each other. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Some people would say it's just incredible hubris to expect we could measure things at that time, this time, and expect them to match. But that's the beauty of cosmology, of observational cosmology in the last 50 years. It's gotten to the point where a mismatch is of con- is of some concern. And it's just, I think both you and I, when we start our careers, if anyone ever said, well, two different ways of extrapolating get, differ by, you know, two or three right, kilometers. Per second. Second. We would yeah. have said, yeah, that's great agreement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think and it is. it's amazing that we can talk seriously <laughs> about that. But but obviously, as one of the people, you know, as the head of the key project, um, uh, the next major uh, tool beyond the CMB is now the James Webb Space Telescope and and the use of supernova, which which I which we'll go into in a second. And so I guess it became incumbent upon you. And obviously you wanted to do this anyway, to try and check to see if perhaps um, you know, there's a problem with the local distance measurement, or at least what what it was more accurately. So, um, so more recently, uh, you've um, been using the James Webb Space Telescope, and also not just Cepheids to try, because there are other ways to try and measure local distances. So let's talk about those a little bit, uh, and and then the importance of you you mentioned the importance of Type One A supernovae which led to the discovery, uh, the observational discovery of dark energy. But um, but why don't we just touch, talk about all of those things a little bit before we get okay. to it. Yeah, so going back to, you know, the philosophy of the key project, and I think it was an important one, and why the result has stood the test of time was not to rely on one single method. And so what had evolved in sort of intervening years was the Cepheid distance scale was uh, the part of the determinations, uh, the basis of going out to larger distances and calibrating these type 1a supernovae that we'll talk about. And uh, with James Wimb and also with Hubble, we had a project with Hubble a few years ago, we went back to a method that we actually used at the 10% level with the key project uh, using red giant branch stars. So it's these are stars that are evolved stars. Our, our sun will become a red giant. And the, the star, th- these are stars that we do understand the physical basis for. Unlike the Cepheids, you can go and, and understand those from first principles. And it's, it's well understood nuclear physics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and so these stars, uh, they've burned all the hydrogen in their core. And once that hydrogen was exhausted, the, the core collapsed and they have a degenerate helium core. So the hydrogen got turned, fused into helium and they have a degenerate helium core that's surrounded by a hydrogen shell. And that's powering the luminosity. You're still fusing hydrogen into helium in this shell. And the star is climbing what we call the red giant branch until it reaches a point where the temperature then is is high enough. It's about 100 million degrees. And it can ignite uh, helium yeah. burning. So you, you're dumping this helium onto the core, but the core can't expand the way it does in a normal star because it's degenerate. And so you end up with a thermal uh, nuclear runaway. The, the temperature keeps increasing and you're burning thing. And very, very rapidly, the star leaves this tip of the red giant branch and falls onto what we call the horizontal branch, much lower luminosity. And so the effect of that, uh, empirically, what we see is that there's this wall uh, between, you know, the stars climbing, the, the many stars in the population, they climb the giant branch and then they reach this period of uh, core helium flash, um, which mm-hmm. is well understood from nuclear physics. And then, uh, then they don't ascend the giant branch anymore. And so you can measure where that, um, that discontinuity occurs and you can measure it very accurately. And it turns out not to have a uh, very strong dependence on the metallicity, but it also can be calibrated and much more easily than for Cephe. It's very straightforward and it doesn't have a dependence on age. And, uh, and most importantly, you can measure these red giants out in the halos of galaxies. Because, yeah. so it's far away from the disk where the star formation is still going on in a spiral. And there's galaxy. not as much dust in the halos. There's and... no dust. There's no crowding or blending. And so it's a much cleaner way of measuring. The and, I, and as you say, I think the difference is that that unlike Cepheids, that red giants, the, from a fundamental physics perspective, you can try you can try and understand their luminosity pretty pretty. Yeah. The fu- fundamental physics gives it to you, and yeah. and it and they're very and this tip of the red giant branch, that maximum luminosity is a very important point. I mean, the only time I've you know I've been a professor of astrophysics, astronomy as well as physics, but I'm a physicist. But 
but the only the probably the most astronomical or astrophysical things I've done was with a colleague of mine, Brian Shabway, where we tried to very carefully look at all the uncertainties to try and measure the age of of globular mm -hmm. clusters by using this by using that tip. And the interesting thing is, we looked at nuclear physics uncertainties. We did vast Monte Carlos, which is what my part of the program was. And the interesting thing in the end, as I remember, in spite of all the nuclear physics uncertainties and the atomic physics uncertainties of trying to, from fundamental first principles, um, that relate that turnoff point to age, the uncertainty, the biggest uncertainty was still distance. The distance, that's right. It, it was that's at the end of it all, it turned out, I remember when he came, it was all still distance. Yeah. That was, yeah. yeah that, it, it, and that's really improved, you know, with Gaia, uh, especially in a few years, that's really going to be nailed, which is, which is nice, but that's right. So it, it, it's, so for us, it was an opportunity to say, okay, we're not going to put all our eggs in one basket with the Cepheids, yeah. but we're going to use these tip of the red giant branch stars. And then we've also developed, so Barry Medora and I was a uh, very close collaborator uh, uh, on the distance scale. Uh, uh, and in, it was a pandemic project for us to look at a different kind of star, a carbon star, mm -hmm. um, what we've called JAGB stars, is J region asymptotic giant branch stars. And these are not you know, they're similar to the Cepheids in the sense that we can't go, it's not from first principles to yeah. tell you what the luminosity would be. So it's another empirical relation as for the Cepheids, as for supernovae. But um, these stars are, they're more massive and uh, and they're brighter than the red giant branch stars. Okay. And the mo most massive of these stars, so th these were discovered by uh, two astronomers, uh, Weinberg and Nikolaev, actually in uh, around 2000. And they were looking at stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud again. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that in the infrared, these stars have a nearly constant luminosity again, or brightness. And so um, we started to compare the distances that came from measuring the luminosity function of these stars with what we had measured or what was already published by others uh, using the red giant branch, the tip of the red giant branch. And we discovered that there was this amazing correlation. They read really well. And so we started to pursue that with new data from Las Campanas uh, using the Magellan Telescope and uh, with Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, that became part of our proposal to James Webb was to use the three methods, JGB, TRGB, and Cepheids, to measure distances to the same galaxy. To so the same galaxy using three. All of which, yeah, can calibrate the supernovae. I was going to ask, but I was also going to point out when it comes to the tip of the red giant, which is, I guess, my own knowledge is greatest there. The fact that the greatest uncertainty was the distance measurement. Actually, in your point of view, from your point of view, that's the best thing because it means all the other uncertainties that's right. don't feed into your this distance. The one thing that really determines this is distance. And, and you don't have to worry about nuclear physics or atomic physics or at the level you're interested in. So you know, that makes it really, yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. That, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was the, it was a bugbear for us, but it's a bet boon for you. Um, uh, but now why I want to ask the same question then why, uh, when, when I asked you about Hubble, why Hubble now, why JWST? What's the advantage there? So Hubble turned out to be a fantastic machine for discovering Cepheids. And so one of the things we haven't talked about is the amplitude of the light variation is largest at blue wavelengths, and it right. decreases as you go to the infrared. It's a temperature sensitivity issue. And, and so we know that the effects of dust are much smaller at infrared wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Um, but finding the Cepheids is best done in the optical where the amplitudes are large. You can actually see the signal. Yeah. But, and so Hubble has been fantastic for discovering Cepheids, for using Cepheids, let us go out farther, et cetera, et cetera. But it really reached its limit, right? Supernovae are faint. So trying to measure the, the Cepheids in the galaxies that are, you know, really at Hubble's mm -hmm. limit, that's, you know, challenging. And again, you have to worry about systematics because they're going to kill you if you don't get them right. And, and so James Webb, which has a bigger aperture, and about 10 times the sensitivity of Hubble in, at these infrared wavelengths, and also four times the resolution for the, for the detectors that uh, were available on HSD and are available now on, on JWST. So you, again, just 
as in the case uh, when we got above the Earth's atmosphere with Hubble, we can now go and look at the same Cepheids that have been discovered already with Hubble, but at higher resolution with JWST in the infrared where the effects of dust are smaller and make more accurate measurements. And it comes down again to systematics. So you can make lots and lots of measurements, decrease your statistical uncertainties, but in the end, it's going to be the systematics that are going to kill you if they're and, there. But, but I guess that JWST measures, what's better about measuring the infrared than, than the optical? Is there, is, is there the effects of dust are less? Uh, okay. Oh. That's the, that's basically oh, it. And metallicity too. Um, and, okay. So that, the, so it's not like, just resolution and, and field of view. It's also that using the infrared helps you reduce some of those other systematic uncertainties. Yeah. But the resolution. So, you know, if you have stars that are near your Cepheid and, and, you know, in some cases, not just nearby, but maybe even underneath that you can't separate at all or you have difficulty separating, especially if you don't have enough signal for these distant mm -hmm. objects, um, you know, you're going to get the measurements wrong. So the increased resolution is, is vital. OK, so some people may have wondered why we've gone through all this. And, and, um, and uh, because these are the things that determine whether the hard stuff, whether, whether there's some new physics. And, and if you really want to, you know... Uh, 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 it, it, you know, as Carl Sagan said, I guess, you know, uh, what it was an amazing place. Extraordinary right? claims require extraordinary yeah. evidence. Yeah, yeah, extraordinary way. claims do require extraordinary evidence. And it is an extraordinary claim that there's some new physics that none of us have ever thought about. Um, although there's, is at some level, but that somehow that, that, that it's going to come into the universe at this level is an extraordinary claim. One that I've always been skeptical of, I must admit. And so now, ta-da, and I'm happy to say just for your sake, that this will appear after your paper appears, um, so, <laughs> so we're not going to preempt or, uh, your 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 uh, your uh, firepower there. Or your, um, but you are now in the. I have been fortunate enough, and you let me see the penultimate version of 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 the results of this paper um, uh, by your collaboration using three different techniques, and it's the Chicago Carnegie Hubble program. It's called CCHP. And, um, and then, and one thing we actually, the one thing before we get to it, you're measuring local numbers and then you want to compare it to the far numbers. So you want to be able to use the, the one thing that allows you that last step in the distance matter and ladder, and that's supernovae. We haven't yet gotten explained why supernovae are of interest. So why don't you, why don't you ex at least mention that? And then we'll give you a result. So Cepheids are what we call supergiant stars. They're very bright. We can see them to, you know, uh, impressive distances. But one thing we have to worry about is that galaxies like to be around other galaxies. They're located in clusters. They're located near to each other. And they, they impact the velocities of other galaxies via their mutual gravitational mm -hmm. interaction. And so those, um, what we call peculiar velocities can be a sizable fraction of the Hubble velocity. So remember what Hubble mm -hmm. measured was velocity versus distance. The farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. Mm -hmm. So the Cepheids can't be observed far enough away that the, these peculiar velocities are a small fraction of the Hubble velocity. So we tie into objects that are brighter that we can see to greater distances. And the type 1a supernovae represent the endpoint stellar evolution for stars, possibly that uh, a, a white dwarf, very dense star that's having matter dumped on it by a companion. And, and the star explodes when it gets to a certain mass. And we can see that explosion uh, to very great distances. And, and then the peculiar velocity that's induced by the gravitational interactions of these galaxies is just a small fraction of the Hubble velocity. But it's so particular that the, that the supernova 1As, it's a certain type of supernova, yeah. comes from a certain type of star, which is always more or less the same size. And therefore, the explosion has always more or less, and that the more or less is the hard part, more or less the same brightness. So it's, it's relying on the fact that while supernovae have many different brightnesses, that this type of supernovae can be measured and, and the way it brought, the time it's bright and everything else is, it's almost like Cepheids is, to, is related to the. Yeah. They have the to be velocity. standardized, right? Yeah. So, you know, they, they, the peak brightness relates to how fast they decline in luminosity, yeah. not unlike Cepheids, yeah. um, but it's possible empirically again to, to do that. Yeah, so, we, again, theoretically, there's been a lot of theoretical work, but empirically, 
it was discovered, lo and behold, that the peak brightness and the time it takes to be bright, just like Cepheid says, is empirical relationship to the to their absolute brightness and 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 therefore their distance. So they became the 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 latter the next step that would take you from from the local distances. And so what your project does is... Yeah, they go at the farthest and they have the least scatter. They have the least scatter because, yeah. yeah. And so what your project did when you was to look at the local distance measures and then tie them to some local supernova, right? Right. In 11 galaxies or something like Mm -hmm. that. And and then use that to, to, to try and extrapolate out to measure the Hubble constants at large. Use those then supernovae to get a distance measure and drum roll. Um, <laughs> what's the result? So we're finding that the three methods agree reasonably well, given their uncertainties. There is a bit of a range, but on average, they give a Hubble constant of about 70. And um, what's interesting to us is that the JGB and the TRGB methods, those distances agree extremely well. They're just they're just almost exactly on with the with the CMB measurements. Those ones, which which at least for the I don't know about much about the carbon star one, but I have to say as a someone who's come with this as a theorist, if I had to pick the one measure that I would trust the most, it would be the horizontal branch one because I know most about it, but also because it is the other I know the other I've studied the other uncertainties in great detail and I know they're small. And and um, and therefore, I was quite pleased to see that that method gives. <laughs> Lars Bilsen said something similar to me a few years ago. If you would to trust any method, but again, he's modeled these stars. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. And well, uh, yeah, methods. I've looked at. I spent a lot of time worrying about uncertainties, and yeah. and 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 you know, because at the time, the age uncertainty was a big issue about whether it can constrain cosmology. But, yeah. and but so the, a, it, you know, what we're seeing is that there is an offset with the Cepheids, which is yeah, just, the Ce- I was going to say that when you look at your data, I was just going to, I mean, you said they agree reasonably well, but the key point is the Cepheids still give 72, right? Yeah. yeah. After all of that. And the other ones are giving 69 more or less. Yeah. And so there does seem to be some systematic offset with the Cepheids, which I guess we just don't understand, right? Right. And I think what's important to say about that is that those are the distances. So it's before we go to the step of putting, bringing in the supernovae, which is another step where there might be other systematics, mm-hmm. right? We're measuring distances here. And so what we're seeing is some systematic offset. And that's not cosmology. That's measuring distances. That's so, measure, And that Cepheids are systematically giving you a different distance. So the yeah. what it looks like is that the 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 announce the the newspaper headlines announcing the death of the standard model of cosmology were probably a little premature, and 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 I think they're premature, and I think you know coming back to your quote of Sagan's extraordinary evidence uh, claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, I still find it very intriguing to think you know maybe there is something that's yeah, different, yeah. but we but this is hard. It's it is challenging. There are systematic effects that become more challenging, the the lower we want to have the error bars, yeah, yeah. the more challenging the systematics become. So yeah, when I look at these data, it's hard for me to make a, you know, five, this is not a five sigma yeah, idea. Yeah, this is, the evidence is, is no longer extraordinary. Let me put it that I way. Don't, I don't think Some people would have you know, claimed it's, it's that it's consistent. You know, yeah. you could still make a case that, you know, it's consistent yeah. with, with the higher value, but but except uh, alone, it looked like it was I want to say five sigma, which it, it, which is almost the kind of level that in particle physics we use for real discovery. But it's it's you know sigma being the likelihood of 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 those two things agreeing. Five sigma means it's a likelihood of one in a million or something like that. Or, yeah, if the errors are well understood. And yeah, yeah. If the assuming all the errors are well understood, assuming right. it's it's statistics and not systematics, which of course is right. with systematics it's hard to measure sigma in that case because it's. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, all of that's technical issues. But now, so with 72 versus 69 at those levels, it looked like there was a real problem. When you have two other distance estimators for the same galaxies that give 69, um, it looks a lot more like it's a, it's some systematic uncertainty that we don't yet understand in Cepheids. That's, when I looked at your paper, that was my, you know, my take from it. And, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's always great to discover, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with our picture of the universe, but it doesn't happen very often. If it, and, and that's what I try and tell people is that, you know, um, 
radical new discoveries don't happen very often. If they did, they'd be, you know, anyone would do, could do them and they'd be happening all the time. More often, it's, it's, it's pedestrian things. And so there may be, you know, and we still don't understand dark energy. Like, make me clear, I've been arguing for dark energy since 1984 almost, but 95 d- dramatically. And, and we still don't understand it. So there's a lot we don't understand, but, but, um, and, and I think that's, you know, what's so interesting about this is, you know, it is a very funny standard model that we have. Yeah, right? we don't it is understand one dark that energy is. We don't know what the dark matter is, you know, so we keep hoping that there'll be some hint somewhere that yeah. will tell us something that will make us, you know, have progress on yeah. this. Exactly. And we keep looking I mean, for progress. Would be bubble cuts. You know, yeah. it'd be great to have five signal evidence. That exactly. Says, okay, this is one thing we know for certain. And, yeah, mm-hmm. and I think we're not there yet. And but I, but I think what's clear from what we've done is that there are obvious things, next steps that you can do to really improve. And that's this. what I want to do in the last in the last half hour. So I want to talk about these steps, including some you're involved in. But but at the same time, it is your, your point is, is well taken, and I've often said it's frustrating. Look, I've been a particle physicist. I've been a you know my whole life in a way. And the frustrating thing about the standard model of particle physics is it works. And yet we know there are things that we need to understand, but we still, but when we're looking for something that disagrees with the damn predictions and, and I've often said it, the standard, you know, even 20 years ago, the standard, I was worried the standard model of cosmology would become exactly like that. We've got this picture that works and you keep looking for a place where it doesn't work and you don't understand some fundamental things like dark matter and dark energy, but we're looking for something new and it keeps and it's and it's now been well now it's only you know thirty years in particle physics it's been fifty or sixty or seventy, but it is frustrating and so it's 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 psychologically attractive I have to yeah, say yeah I think that's you know it's human nature to want you know it's exciting yeah. to find something yeah new. and so therefore I have to say I think that's part of this is that when you can look for something that doesn't agree, you hear lots of talk about it because hey maybe this is the great hope of of something that will give us some evidence that'll tell us which is the right direction to go, but. As an, exp- as an observer, the right direction to go is always new observations. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about them, and I want to talk about uh, the, con- the challenges to new observations. And one of the, new, you know, we've, we've discussed this with malice of forethought in terms of new instruments coming on board, changing our picture, or allowing us to do things we couldn't do before. And, and the next set of new instruments after JWST are going to be these large, very large telescopes on Earth. And coincidentally, it turns out that you happen to be the director of the, or, of the, of the Giant Magellan Telescope Project, which is they're going to be the largest telescope in the world, right? And so it, it happens to be a good place to talk about that right now. So, okay. Yeah, you're correct. I was founding uh, director of the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is um, a 25 meter uh, telescope, which will be located in the Andes Mountains in Chile. And uh, this is a telescope we hope will be operational in the early 2030s. And it will have a resolution that's 10 times that of the Hubble Space Telescope. Wow. And so will be, I think, very interesting in terms of you know, improving our resolution and measurement of, of Cepheids, tip of the red giant branch, carbon stars, et cetera. And uh, for following up the type 1A supernovae that we're going to have, you know, order a million of these things with the Rubin Observatory, which is about to start observing, you know, within this year. So uh, exciting. Well, let's, uh, it's nice. That's makes it all sound so easy, but. Um, <laughs> it's uh, been a uh, long uh, road. <laughs> yeah. But let's step back because I want to give a sense. One of the reasons I love being a theorist is I can come up with an idea, write a paper and then do something else. And, and, you know, and for particle experimentalists, I can watch them spend 30 years, uh, especially we waiting for an accelerator and then building a large experiment. And these now, and, and when it comes to astronomy, it is somewhat similar. It's big science. And these things aren't done easily. When you're the founding director, when was the Giant Magellan Telescope? Just give people a sense. You're right. It's going to be operational, we hope, in the 2030s. When were, you, when were the first discussions that you had about building it? So the first discussions were probably around the year 2000. And in fact, sort of just an interesting historical note, uh, we had some discussions with Caltech at the time about possibly joining what at that time was called the California Extremely Large Telescope or CELT. Yeah. And um, so that was just before I became the director of the observatory. I became the director in 2003. And 2002, I you know, had some discussions with the then president of the institution about joining CELT. 
And uh, that didn't materialize. I wasn't director at the time, wasn't able to carry that forward. And, and so in 2003 was when we uh, began to, to plan um, for what became the Giant Magellan Telescope. And, and, you know, there had been lots of discussion uh, when it fell through with Caltech about what we would do in, in 2002. Um, but, you know, when I became director, I, I took it upon myself to uh, really advance the project. And, and that um, was the Carney Institution, that, that, which is separate from Caltech, although it's down the road. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and people and, you know, geographically, it looks the same from outside of Pasadena, but long history there. And yeah. But uh, so you know, we cast the first mirror for the telescope. Each of these mirrors is 8.4 meters in diameter. All seven now have been cast. And we started the first one uh, in two, th July of 2005. And um, it's been a long, so long. Been, that's what I want to point. It's going to be 30 years, more or less, from the time this yeah. is, you know, talking about the kind of difficulty of doing good, uh, of new science at this level. And the mirrors, just to give an example, I don't know, but I mean, the mirrors have to be accurately cast to what kind of precision? So they, you know, the surface of these mirrors is, uh, they've been polished to 20 nanometers. 20 billionths of a meter. So it's like if you took one of these mirrors and you spread it out to the size of the you know continental U.S., the size of the Rocky Mountains would be, I think, if I'm recalling correctly, something like less than an inch. I mean, it is smooth. <laughs> yeah. And it took a long time to learn how to do that. The first one took seven years. Um, these are not easy, you know, buy them off the shelf yeah. kinds of yeah. things. You have to, so it requires new technology, new science. And uh, mm -hmm. again, when I was in Arizona down the road, there were people who worried about making mirrors down at Yeah, no, it's a fantastic times. facility. Yeah, yeah, University of Arizona. And, um, and uh, also, are they... Uh, are, are they individually deformable or not uh, for the this individually is, for deformable. adaptive optics? So, so each one of these will have um, actuators on the back that can be, uh, you know, be push and pull on the surface um, at sort of um, seconds, 30 second or so time scales. But then there are adaptive optics that's, you know, uh, that are uh, thinner mirrors that are the secondary mirrors. And each one, each of the primary mirrors has an adaptive secondary. And those can be deformed on millisecond time scales. And, and, what, and, and, and yeah, we won't go into great detail, but that allows you to take into account the effects of the atmosphere. The mirrors right. can be deformed. The power it, of a Hubble without going. Yeah, because the atmosphere varies. But if you can know what the variation is and you can some using lasers and things, you can then immediately uh, let the mirrors know how to deform appropriately to take into account. It's amazing. It's yeah. almost like a Maxwell's yeah. demon. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it is amazing technology. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I remember so when it was first, uh, I first talked about it. I first had a picture of it when it was really, a, I remember when I wrote the physics of Star Trek and it was just so, you know, it was a laser and it was just seemed like such a, that was in the early nineties, I guess. And it was like, oh yeah, well maybe, but I don't believe it'll, you know, Always, yeah. my attitude is always, yeah, but it won't operating work. Operating on telescopes on the ground now. I mean, it, it it works. It is technology that has been tested and used. Yeah, no, it's amazing, uh, and you know, and yeah. it's all. I I constantly underestimate the ability of experimentalists to do things, or I try not to anymore. But it's it always seems virtually impossible to imagine how this will be useful, and then it yeah, always never ends imagine up that something can't be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. Sure, I admire, maybe, as but, a theorist, yeah. I admire experimentalists more and more, and and am more jealous of. That. And, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, our site, you know, the site has been leveled, the, the pier is ready for the, um, the telescope structure and the telescope to arrive and, you know, the contracts are being let. And so, um, yeah, we're just trying to raise the rest of the funding. Yeah. Partnership is international now. There are many countries involved. And, How many and countries? Use that. U.S. So there's um, Brazil, Korea, South Korea, Australia, uh, Taiwan now, and um, uh, the Weizmann Institute in Israel is a recent partner. So it's in Chile, of course. In so, Chile yeah. and U.S. Yeah, and is a lot Canada of a partner too, or no? What's that? Is Canada a partner at all? No, no. Okay, since you're both Canadian. Okay, and it, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it uh, as as I say, as a theorist, I become, you know, I do, I did a degree in math and one in physics, so I wouldn't have to take an advanced lab specifically and now i'm more and more jealous about i wish i'd done it but anyway um how much does it cost and by the end i know you don't like to talk about well, people don't like to talk about it but just to give a sense of how hard this is and yeah it, it you know essentially it's roughly a two billion dollar project two, this is two a, billion this is and 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 
is it and was it estimated to be two billion originally or i mean it's, these things get more expensive over time and i mean you know it's two things one is inflation of course yeah. brings the price you know 30 years since we first started talking about this but the other is you know and this was a worry that i had early on uh leading the project was you know telescopes had been built single mirror telescopes had been built you bring the mirror to a common yeah the light to a common focus but this was many pieces yeah. that had to work together so the systems engineering you know is, is uh you know and then you know these mirrors also they're off axis right most mirrors before you brought the you know light would come in mm -hmm. and then uh, the parabola would focus it yeah. a single focus but now you have to do this with these 20 ton you know moving mirrors uh that you're trying to correct and that's not simple and so it, as I said, the first mirror took seven years to learn how to test it well and to make these, um, you know, the surface smooth to 20 nanometers RMS uh, took a lot of learning. Um, wow. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. Um, wow. Okay. Well, it's going to, okay. Now, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Well, one of the things that I think is going to be very exciting is that, uh, you know, in the last several decades, we, of course, have learned about the existence of other planets around other stars. Mm -hmm. And the technology is just shy of reaching where you can measure the motions of Earth mass planets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the most exciting potential discoveries a telescope of this nature could make is the discovery of life on an Earth mass planet. Yeah. And that you know, will be feasible with you be able to measure the atmospheres of Earth mass planets and look for biosignatures. If they're, if they're atmospheres, I have to say, some, you know, it's been a little depressing to look at a lot of star, a lot of planets and not find at, you know, interesting atmospheres, but there well, may see, be. We it's may again, be alone. science your question, right? I mean, a few decades ago, we didn't even know whether there were other planets. Yeah, I know, I know. And the fact we know thousands and yeah, and we'll find out. It'll help us know if we're alone. I'm betting we're not. But again, but, you know, it's technology. Every time we build bigger and bigger telescopes we make discoveries and and often ones we can't anticipate right i can well, tell usually you usually the, the ones those are the exciting yeah. ones yeah. yeah i mean that's what i always say every time you open a new window on the universe you're surprised and yeah. i tell people every day i'm surprised if i'm not surprised yeah. because no that's you know i really want to see this telescope <laughs> yeah because one can one look it, you know <laughs> i often tell people and i it, that when we write scientific proposals we lie we say why we're going to do this, right? Because you got to have good reason to do it, especially you're going to spend $2 billion. For me, it was a few hundred thousand dollars with supporting group. But you still, here's why I'm doing it. But what you really hope, of course, is, you know, you tell what you're going to be doing in, in a theorist. You, if you're an observer, maybe you talk about 20 years down the road. I, I was talking about three years down the road. Here's what we're going to be doing three years down the road. And my hope always was that I would be doing something completely different because of of the discoveries and that's what we really hope so the point is you're not lying you're, you're you're sticking to what you know but you know you're hopeful that you're actually going to find something com completely different a absolutely i mean my new my my most recent book is called in the u.s the known uh, in, in england the known unknowns for uh, after a famous quote um in the u.s is called the edge <laughs> of knowledge because they didn't want to have a donald rumsfeld quote on the cover but <laughs> But um, it's still a good but, quote. But the known, un it's good to know the known unknowns because that justifies why you're going to do what you're going to do. But the most exciting thing is the unknown unknowns, and of course, yeah. that's exciting. But it would make a much shorter book, of course. But but uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's also what is the problem for the Hubble constant, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Unknown unknowns that get you. Yeah, yeah it's, those are the ones that come and get you exactly. So so planets. What else? Uh, so, you know, in terms of dark matter, dark energy, you know, distribution of dark matter in the universe, um, measuring distant supernovae and trying to characterize the evolution of, you know, the the rate of change of the expansion over cosmic time uh, at, in conjunction with telescopes like Rubin. Um, pretty much, you know, black holes, planets. Um, it's everything. It's just going to be one. The evolution, the initial mass function. I mean, every area in astronomy is going to be touched by, you know, increase in capability of, of this magnitude. And now, just to be fair, though, of course, this isn't the only big telescopes that's being built or designed. And how um, how does it compare with the other ones that are coming online, the European one? And I don't yes, know if ever, I doubt anything's going to happen in Hawaii, but I don't know. We'll see. We don't know. I really hope that both telescopes, you, you know, U.S. telescopes will get built. You know, there are, I believe, 16 telescopes between six and a half and 10 meter diameter uh, and oversubscribed that so that, you know, having three telescopes in the world of these uh, extremely large telescopes is not too many. There will be a lot of uh, oversubscription on those. 
So there, as you say, there's one in Europe and uh, they're aiming to build a 39 meter telescope and they appear to be on track to, to be operational by 2030. So they'll, they'll, they're lo- more likely to come on, online first before GMT? Or no? Possibly. Uh, if we had the funding issue solved, we could start tomorrow and we could just go fast. Yeah. We are ready so, I mean, go. so I assume it's a big race, right? Because the first one out. Is well, gonna there's gonna be a lot. It, of... it is a big race, but but there's the long game too. There's a lot of there's a big sky out there that uh, awaits discovery and in different instruments on the telescopes too. And then there's a, the the second U.S. led telescope um, is the TMT, the 30 meter telescope, and and that's a, a partnership of a couple of U.S. institutions and Canada and India and mm-hmm. Japan, and uh, they had China until recently. Okay. Um, well, look, let, let's, um, so, okay. So what, let me ask in a general sense, what's, what's the future? What are the biggest challenges, opportunities that you can see for the field? And then I want to be, become more personal. And then I want to go in a, in a, I want to talk a little bit about the sociology at the end. So just so you know, where we're heading. Um, what's the future? What are the biggest, what are the big questions that you th- think are going to be resolvable in, in say, your lifetime um, in, in, uh, in, in I'd technology? I'd like to understand dark energy. Yeah. I'd like to know what the dark matter is. I've been searching for a long time, and I think one of the real possibilities that would be disappointing is that we'll never know, that it only interacts yeah. gravitationally and there's no way of detecting it. But but it would be really exciting if we could. That, that would be a big uh, step forward. I, I think What's coming on in in the next few years, I mean, it really is going to be an exciting time. So the Vera Rubin telescope, which is this um, six and a half meter telescope that will survey the sky every few nights, will go very deep and uh, follow transient objects, lots of supernovae being discovered, you know, distribution of dark matter with really deep fields. And so, you know, again, is it called the Vera Rubin telescope? Because, you know, Vera Rubin was certainly one of the first people to get evidence for dark matter. And profound evidence from. I her think it's group. nice recognition of of Vera. It's it's that's it's that's wonderful. Really nice. She was wonderful. I knew her. You yeah. knew her. But but uh, yeah. but it, will it be able, will it be is it designed to look for dark matter in it? Anyway? Well, you know, it, it, one of the things that it will do well is to characterize the distribution of dark matter. But again, with all these telescopes, you know, you design it. You know, people very early on were interested in dark matter. Uh, and then you never in the field change. That's the other thing. You, you design it, and then I wonder if has that affected GMT. It's like it's like satellite, it's like space instruments, right? You design it, and it and it's thirty years before it comes up, and often the field has changed. Sometimes the technology has changed, and sometimes the questions have changed, and yeah. you have to deal with that. And I assume it's happening with the GMT too, right? Oh yeah, very much so. I mean, certainly the Hubble tension wasn't around the opportunity to look for Earth mass planets. We didn't have the capability of doing yeah. that when we were first talking about GMT. I mean, only the first planets had been discovered in nineteen ninety five. Um, so yeah, it, and things really move and some things get done, right? When you're doing your yeah. science document in 2003, some things are already, already done before you get there. But, um, so, and there's going to be, um, uh, the Roman, Nancy Grace Roman space telescope, which is going to be launched in 2026 or so. And that's going to do an infrared survey of the sky. And that's going to, I think, be really interesting. It'd be great for us with tip of the red giant branch and opportunity to really uh, do the halos well in galaxies. And, um, and you know, it, it will be a, a survey instrument that will study the Milky Way galaxy and, and, and you know, again, many, many different fields. And, and I think LIGO and Virgo and you know, the opening of gravitational wave astronomy, I, you know, I'm very excited. I hope eventually there will be more of these um, gravitational wave sirens, which is a completely independent way of measuring the Hubble constant. Unfortunately, nature has not been kind and it's only delivered one neutron star, neutron star <laughs> binary to make this measurement. But you would hope with time yeah. you know, there will be more of these and that I think will be important, not for just for the Hubble constant, but also for dark energy. And um, yeah, I, I uh, so, so again, with new technology comes new discoveries and there's just a lot coming online that, I, you know, many yeah, of these, I hope many time. of these big telescopes. Let yeah. me ask you another way, because I get people get asked this about accelerators is, you know, as people say, the Large Hadron Collider be the last large accelerator. Will, will, will the GMT and the, and the what ELT, 
Will they be the last large t Earth-based telescopes, or do you think there's going to be another it, generation? It be. I, I think, you know, with ingenuity of people, space is going to become the place to do it, to actually either make the mirrors in space or unfurl, you know, it's different technology for the mirrors and interferometry and, you know, long baselines and, and maybe even filling some of those baselines. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if not the last, it'll, they'll be the last for a while. They, last they, for a while. They, yeah, well, and they're expensive, and, and that always is a problem. So well. space. But I think people are getting, you know, the, the opportunity now in space is going to get. I'm just glad space. there are a lot of other things to do than measure dark. I always, am, when people are going to somehow measure dark, determine something about dark energy, I always, I have to say, I'm, I made a bet with a bunch of people, although they haven't ever acknowledged that, that, uh, that they made that bet. Uh, one was Stephen Hawking, another was. Frank Wilczek. But uh, at the time w w that in the 1990s, that dark energy would not, we wouldn't understand what it was. And there'd be not a single measurement that would tell us it wasn't a cosmological constant in 10 years. And I'm going to, I'm going to make that bet now that even after GMT comes out, we're still not going to have any. No, I, wouldn't take the bet. I wouldn't take yeah, the bet. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be solved. I think, uh, unfortunately, observationally, we're going to have to come up with a good idea, which is a lot. Well, I don't know if it, you might say it's not a lot harder, but it, it comes up fewer. fewer. And, the, you know, the whole paradigm could shift. It, yeah, it, yeah, we're going to need to know something fundamental need we don't understand. I, I don't think that's going to be solved by observation, whereas I do think dark matter will be. I think, uh, But we'll, observations could help point you. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I'm, I'm, I would love it. But my hope, but my fear is it's going to be constant and not observably different. And, and, and actually, that's my expectation, not just my fear. I would be amazed, shocked. I would have been shocked in 1995, 98. I'm going to be shocked now. 30 years later, what are, what are, besides the future of the field, what about your personal goals? What do you want to do next? Um, yeah, I've been actually giving a lot of thought to this recently because, um, uh, I, I have another project left in me, I feel. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> and so I actually, you know, I have a few ideas. I'm not going to talk to you about yeah, them. Maybe right don't want to read that. Don't, don't. Yeah. Me. But, but I, I, I do feel I have another chapter in me and I feel, you know, we need to finish up this stuff with JWST, but there are clear steps there. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing something else. Okay, good. I hope you do. I'm, I'm hope, I hope that'd be great. Now I do want to end maybe with a whimper rather than a bang. That was the bang part. This is the whimper. The, so, the sociology affects science. And we talked about Monica, we didn't, I alluded to it, although the listeners might not know. There was another big telescope that was set to begin a long time ago on Hawaii. And it's, and it's not begun. And it's been 10, 20 years that it's been delayed, at least, because of people's concerns that somehow it affects, that, that, that building a telescope on the top of a mountain is going to somehow interfere with indigenous people's religion. Maybe, I don't know if that, maybe that's an unfair simplification. But it, it has affected it. And, 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 and what do you, maybe you don't have to answer any of these questions, but what do you think about this? I think, you know, for a long time, um, people have, um, you know, how, how do I answer this? Um, you know, people do have sensitivities and I think it's important to understand where people come from, mm -hmm. including it's important for people to understand what science is about. And I yeah. think, you know, this is not just in the context of the telescope, but it's context, you know, in our society in general now yeah. is that there's, there are misunderstandings that arise, you know, what is science? What can science do? You know, can you just, you know, people who would look at science and say, I just don't believe it and, yeah. the, and, but don't really have an understanding of what science is or how it proceeds. So, you know, I think on all sides, it's incumbent on us to communicate and, and then, you know, when communication goes badly, you run into problems. And, uh, you know, so you know, all I can say is that I, as I said earlier, I hope both of the U S telescopes get built. And if it can't be in Hawaii, then it gets built, you know, on another site yeah. and including Las Campanas. Uh, yeah. yeah. We yeah. actually leveled the mountain while I was uh, still leader of the project and uh, made room for two telescopes. You know, so there are other mountains. There are other and mountains. I hope ultimately both telescopes will get built. I think yeah. it's important. Yeah. 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 No. And, and I, I, I think it's a shame. It, it, it is a shame. I, I always worry when religious or ideology gets in the way of science, but it happens because people do have sensibility and pro and often the problem is the scientific community not communicating well enough and as you know personally and professionally that well, I've spent a, f a fair amount of my professional career 
on communicating science because I think it's important and it's I felt it's at least as important as the science I do. Well, it's something I felt I had to do, and uh, and I believe it's essential. It's the only way we're going to get ahead. Um, I've been a little worried when the scientific community. It's you know, what worries me about the Hawaii situation is this rift in the scientific community where scientists themselves are somehow arguing that science is not universal. Let me put it that way. That somehow, um, it, you know, it it uh, you know there are a lot. The, the sad thing is there are a lot of young scientists who somehow are saying that that the science is somehow interfering with culture or or racist or whatever and and therefore it's a problem and and I, and i i think my suspicion is until the scientific community gets its act together and decides reminds itself that science is actually in principle independent of any human foibles but it's a process that brings humanity together rather than separating it until we get that straight in the community i don't think that you're going to see any progress when in, in terms of getting the public to buy that mm mm-hmm. mhm and 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 then my last question in that regard is is personal. We began back with your high school teacher telling you that you know girls didn't have to listen, which caused you to want to listen more. Um, you know, this is another area of 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 discussion, and I've written about it. But I mean, you know, women being a woman in science has been challenging. I argue. I've been arguing since I was a chair of a physics department you know, recruiting women in science and the first women faculty in the department I was chair of was when I became chair, that it was a great time to be a young woman in science because there was so much interest in getting women in science. But have you, let me ask you personally, and again, don't answer if it's an issue that you don't want to answer to. Have you found that being a woman has gotten in the way of your being a scientist? And do you also think in the current time, that it get that that being a woman a woman in science is harder than being a man or the other way around so you know i think when i began starting from before i became a professional astronomer uh-huh. there there were things that happened along the way that were not positive you know things that got said people who were discouraging mm-hmm. but there were also people who were encouraging so i, I think it was a little mm-hmm. bit of a mixed bag you know uh, at the time that I came into the field, I ended up being a lot of first just because there, you know, well, now, many. That there yeah. just weren't a lot of people ahead of yeah. me at that time. And, and I think also that is sort of a mixed um, bag. Uh, I think, you know, in some instances, there are people, again, who want to help you, who feel that there haven't been women. And then yeah. there are still people who don't and yeah. don't feel that you can you know, fill the shoes of some rule because you aren't a man and yeah. a leader or what you, what people think a leader might look yeah. like. And so I, you know, I think, I do think it's both. I, things have definitely gotten better since I entered the field. It, it was, I, I would almost say, usually I would go to a meeting and I would be one of a very few women. Mm-hmm. And that now can be very different. I can be in a room and there are many women in the, in the room. And that's a new experience for me because, you know, I was used you- to for I'm being this, the only woman in the room. It's yeah, it's changed tremendously in terms of demographics. Um, although I would say astronomy is a field, especially internationally, where women have there have been a lot more women in astro- at least observing situation in say astronomy than in, in say particle physics or something like that early on. It's a field since Henrietta Levin and before that's attracted significant and 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 then you know we. we uh, the, the two telescopes you just mentioned are named after, after significant women, um, and and so it's a yeah, you know, and Nancy Grace Roman was effectively told by the University of Chicago she could not expect to get tenure, and that's how she ended up um, at NASA. And 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 Vera Rubin was of course not allowed to be a graduate student at Princeton, uh, because yeah, and she check- was not allowed uh, to observe at Palomar until she took a little, uh, you know, paper outline of, she, she made a little paper doll and put it on the restroom because their excuse had been, there are no women's restrooms. She yeah. had problem solved and put the little doll on the, on the door. So there were a lot of those things. And yeah, but, and, 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 and I guess the point is that, you know, there have been real roadblocks, but, the, but, um, we've come a long way and, and, but I just wondered in your sense, in your career, have you felt like it ever was a huge impediment? I've sensed no, but, 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 um, I tend to have just, you know, worked. I, I've tended just, to try. The idea is just to do the work. Or, you know, show that 
this is what I want to do. And I don't like getting caught up in things that are, you know, and, you know, and I think people around me have changed too. I mean, there were senior scientists who made comments about women or other women yeah. uh, early on and, and, but I, they changed, they really did. Yeah. They, um, which I think is great. It's actually sometimes younger scientists who, who I think maybe don't, always have the same attitude it's interesting yeah no it's it's interesting being being you know it's demog age demographic because you and i are over a certain age and we can see how things have changed and and I, I do you find out of interest because there are now fewer men going into university as you know and then than women do you find that you're ever at meetings where there are very few men now um, you know, rarely, but I do occasionally find myself in a, a undergraduate classroom and I look around and think, woo, I think there are more women here. There's 60, 40 in general now, 60% yeah, women. That's, 40 that's very different. And, yeah, you know, true. I think things will fluctuate and it doesn't hurt if, you know, it, yeah. they shouldn't always be systematically on the other side of the yeah. line. It's been a <laughs> systematic what? shift. It's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But anyway, I wanted to discuss, discuss this, that little bit of sociology because, um, you're a you're a wonderful scientist, and the really and 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 the last thing I, am I I don't want to put words in your mouth. The last thing a wonderful scientist would want to be called is a wonderful female scientist or a wonderful male scientist. It seems to me, and and or a wonderful white or black or whatever color or short or tall, that 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 um that that's the wonderful thing about science is it's a, it should unify us all and it's can be done by anyone and it's exciting and um and and that's why i worry about identity labels i think we should just call ourselves scientists and and i and i and and and, and that's one of the reasons you know i'm so happy to well i know you as a friend but as a great scientist as well and why i really thank you for for spending time uh explaining the important science you've been doing. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for, very much for having this conversation. Yeah, yeah, anytime. And I look forward to seeing you. So it's been too long since we've been together except for on the screen. And so sometime in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. Hi, it's Lawrence again. As the Origins Podcast continues to reach millions of people around the world, I just wanted to say thank you. It's because of your support, whether you listen or watch, that we're able to help enrich the perspective of listeners by providing access to the people and ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world and driving the future of our society in the 21st century. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also leave us private feedback on our website if you'd like to see any parts of the podcast improved. Finally, if you'd like to access ad-free and bonus content, become a paid subscriber at originsproject.org. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation as a non-profit effort committed to enhancing public literacy and engagement with the world by connecting science and culture. You can learn more about our events, our travel excursions, and ways to get involved at originsproject.org. Thank you.